Hi, sociologists. This is week two, lesson two with Mrs. T. So this is a continuation of our sociological imagination discussion that you watched in week in week two, lesson one. OK, so we need a little bit more information about this connection between macro scale stuff and micro scale experiences. OK, so we are going to look at one of the sociologists who is highlighted in chapter one of our textbook. His name is Emil Durkheim. It is a man. Emil is not a common name in the United States, but it's a French first name for a man. So Emil Durkheim is the guy name who we're going to focus on today because he gave us he's not the father of sociology as it says in our textbook but he is really credited as being the first guy who was able to convince people that society was a thing that had rules and structure that guided our life. Before Emil Durkheim, there were tons of people who were claiming that, but not a whole lot of people who uh, bought into it. He really lived at the perfect time where uh, people really bought into the idea that there wasn't simply a god or the creator who was the center of social life and had rules that guided our micro behavior. That was a very familiar concept prior to Emil Durkheim's lifetime, that God had rules that people must follow for a particular outcome. Emil Durkheim was successful in um, explaining or arguing that society was a thing that had structure and rules that people needed to follow for a certain outcome. So it was really... Um, he just lived in the right time in history when people began to accept that as an alternative to, um, to God being the center of social life. Okay, so that was a little off topic, but there's a little bit of background for you. And today we're going to talk about a concept that he came up with. He came up with this term, social facts, and we're going to talk about what it means and how it's connected to the concept of the sociological imagination. Now, remember back to the sociological imagination when I told you that it was not about make-believe? In, in kindergarten classes right now, there are teachers everywhere telling kids that we're going to use our imagination and make things up. That's not what the sociological imagination is. The sociological imagination is an ability to use facts that are observed, that are collected through scientific organized research methods and analyzed for the connection between those macro scale trends and micro scale life experiences. So imagination does not mean make believe. Imagination means ability to make informed connections. I'm reminding you of that in the sociological imagination discussion because even though I have the word fact up here, the word social facts does not necessarily mean absolute truth. I don't know what Siri would tell you the word facts means precisely if you asked Siri to give you the definition, but typically facts, just when you see that word by itself, that word typically refers to absolute undisputable truth. OK, then somebody recently in political history came up with the term alternative facts. I don't know who that is, but my point here is that in the same way that for sociologists, the imagination does not mean make believe. This word fact is not referring to absolute truth. Rather, when you put this word together, social facts, one word, one concept, Social facts refers to a pattern in a social structure that exists and cr creates a network or control over the thinking, the feeling, and the acting or the behavior of the people in that society. So you see how I have it written here. Social facts are patterned ways of thinking, feeling, and acting that are part of the macro scale social structure and guide or even control. See, I've got control in parentheses because really the patterned way of thinking, feeling, and acting is really a control on our micro scale life experiences. 
and even our attitudes. So thinking, what is our attitude about stuff? Feeling, how are we supposed to respond emotionally? Acting, how are we supposed to behave? On the macro scale in society, there is a pattern that exists for our society that is different for society in India. That's different than the social facts are, the pattern way of thinking and feeling and acting for society in Vietnam. That is different than the social facts of pattern thinking, feeling, and acting in Saudi Arabia. Let's keep on going. Society has different customs, different norms, different beliefs from one location to the next. We will talk about that more in depth in chapter two, I believe it is, two and three together. But social facts are not referring to absolute truth because the pattern of thinking, feeling, and acting is going to change from one society, one social structure example to the next. Are you talking about society in Mexico? Are you talking about society in Argentina? Are you talking about society in Morocco? Those societies have different sets of social facts, different patterns of thinking, feeling, and acting that exist on the macro scale and guide or even control our behavior and attitudes and emotional responses on the micro scale. What the heck? is Mrs. T talking about? Well, here's an example that I came up with. So I teach gender studies. And so I talk about gender roles a lot. A role is the expected duties that you're supposed to perform based on your position that you occupy in life. Well, manliness and femaleness or a womanliness, those are two positions that you can occupy that have certain cultural expectations, certain behaviors associated with being uh, feminine and behaviors associated with being masculine in our society. So regardless of whether you are feminine or masculine or anything in between, society has sort of benchmark measurements uh, ways of thinking, feeling, and acting about your position within the social structure based on whether you are male or female. Let's talk about jobs, for instance. I'm just going to throw some jobs out there and you tell me through text message or on the discussion board, you tell me, are you thinking male or are you thinking female when I say these things? Um, oil rig worker, roofer, construction worker male or female, daycare worker, kindergarten teacher, cashier, male or female. Now, some of those may be crossover. Maybe some of those like cashier maybe was not an excellent example on my part, but let's look at daycare worker, for instance. So a daycare worker compared to which was one of the male ones, oil rig worker. These are two jobs that right out of high school, somebody is qualified to do. Anybody know the difference between the pay of those two things? An oil rig worker, if I'm not mistaken, and you can do some research on this um, to, to see, there's a high school in Houston, Texas, I believe it is, that has almost 90% of their guys who graduate go work on the oil rigs for a little while before they go to college, if they go to college. <coughs> Excuse me. Because I think that they make something like $60,000 a year or something like that right out of high school. So, something around there. Um, some of you might work at a daycare. And the last I checked, it was like eight twenty-five dollars an hour, whatever minimum wage is. But that's kind of because our society has a pattern way of thinking, feeling, and acting about jobs that are typically expected of or appropriate for females compared to jobs that are expected of and appropriate for males. So most females out there, notice I said most, not everybody. Here's one, here, let me stop for a second and tell you, in sociology, we do talk about trends across the board instead of unusual, bizarre circumstances from, from one example to the next. So in, in psychology class, you can talk about the unusual, the abnormal, and that kind of thing. In sociology, we talk about trends across the board.
So trends across the board, the patterned way of thinking, feeling, and acting about somebody who needs to nurture your child in a daycare center, is that a female trait that's associated or, or assigned to the female condition in our society? Or is that a male trait that is associated with the male condition in our society? Nurturing is what I'm asking about here. So if nurturer is a role that typically is assigned to females, then when I say daycare worker, probably the majority of you out there immediately thought female. Well, that means that there is a bias in the patterned way that we have of thinking, feeling, and acting in society. I am not calling you a biased individual because you thought that way, but I want to point out that this bias is part of the pattern that exists above us. It exists outside of our control and it guided the micro scale experience that you had right now. If you thought of daycare worker female, if you thought of oil rig worker male or roofer and male. So typically manual labor that is taxing on the body, maybe a little bit risky if you're climbing on a roof or working on the interstate while cars are zipping by or in the heat of the day, something like that. Typically those kinds of jobs pay more. They are riskier, but is risk a feminine trait or a masculine trait? Is caregiving a feminine trait or a masculine trait? that is valued in society. And don't, please don't mistake right now, don't think that I'm telling you that somehow born into females is a caregiving gene or somehow born into males is a risk gene. No, not at all. Um, we learn that behavior. We will talk about our socialization process in uh, chapter three. But social facts, this is a key term that is very important for you to put in your arsenal of information so that you can develop your sociological imagination over the course of this semester together. Social facts are different from one society to the next because societies are different. There is a society, a culture, a set of customs and beliefs and traditions in England that is different from the society, social facts, the customs, the traditions, the beliefs in Israel, for instance. So the social facts are going to be different. We inherit social facts at birth. The culture that we learn from birth moving forward is based on those pattern ways of thinking, feeling, and acting because our caregivers, those who bring us up in this culture, are responding to the pattern that they learned. So think again about the metaphor of the maze. If you want to turn right, but there's a brick wall, well, you can't turn right, folks. You got to keep going this way or that way where there is a clear passage. If you're walking along a flat wall, the thought might never occur to you to turn right or that right is even a possibility because the pattern way of thinking and feeling and acting doesn't allow a right turn at that point. So social facts and understanding what they are, and hopefully you can see the connection here that just the definition of it brings out more understanding, hopefully, about the sociological imagination. But there are patterns on the macro scale that's part of the social structure that we inherit as members of this society. And because we're in this society, the easiest path forward is simply to toe the line of these patterned ways of thinking, feeling, and acting that pre-exist us. They do change over time. They do change over time, but very slowly. And they exert control. They at least guide, but honestly, I think that's a little bit too mild <laughs> for what they do. I think that these patterns control our microscale experiences to a large extent. They control the, the thoughts that we have, the feelings that we respond with, and the behaviors that we engage in on a, daily, on a daily basis. 
So in the next short video that we have together, I'm going to continue to talk about the work that Emile Durkheim did to sort of prove that social facts are a thing and that society has a shape and the differing shape of society can bring about very different life experiences on the micro scale. So that's our next part of this week's discussion and I will see you in the next video. Bye.